guys, welcome to another chemical engineering tutorial brought to you by the ChemEng student. In this lesson, we're going to take a look at transient processes for a differential balance, and we're going to look at the derivation and an example on how you would actually go about solving this. Now, this is a more advanced method for uh, solving material balances, um, so there's some few tricks and hints here that will make it a lot easier for you um, when you come across it at university. So the first question we need to ask ourselves is, what is a transient process? So a transient process is one in which the value of any system variable changes with time. So in other words, what we are saying here is an unsteady state system. That's essentially what transient means. Now that means inherently that batch and semi-batch systems are always transient since the key variables will change per unit time. Things like the concentration of the product of the reactants. They will, they will change as time progresses, so they're not steady. Now there are two types of balances that can be done. They are the differential balance, which we're going to look at here, or you have the integral balance, which will be done in a subsequent video. And again, I'll put a link in the description to that once that video has came out. But if we take a look at the differential balance method, then what we're going to do is we're going to use the general material balance as our basis for the development of the equations and to solve the case study. So the general balance is that the accumulation is equal to the input plus the generation minus the output minus the consumption. Now a differential balance are only applicable at a given instance of time. And what we mean by that is it will only explain what happens at that specific instance. It will not explain anything out with. So what we're going to do here is for, for the derivation in the model, we're going to use a general component A as our basis. And what we can do is write for a given instance of time, i.e. time plus delta t, where delta t is the increment of time that has passed, we can consider this to be equal to zero, and therefore we can assume that all the variables will remain constant. Because if the delta t, the change in time, is zero, that means the time is fixed. So if we start off with the general balance, then what we can do is express each of these in their own nomenclature state. Now, if you want more details on mass and energy balances or reactor design, I'll link some um, introductory um, videos that we have here on our YouTube channel. I'll put them in the description. But if you want serious detail and really want to know your stuff with mass and energy balances from the most basic to the most advanced with case studies and reactor design, we have two incredibly really fantastic courses on mass and energy balances and reactor design. I'll put a link in the description to them and you can check those ones out because they will make your understanding fully comprehensive of these specific concepts. And these are core for chemical engineering. But anyway, here we have delta M, which is the change in mass and delta T is the increment of time. Now Q in, Q out are the, the flow of the material and R gen and R cons is the generation and the consumption. Now what we can do here is each of these has been multiplied by the time increment. So we can take delta T out as a common factor and then divide by delta T. So we have delta M over delta T is equal to the input, the generation, the output and the consumption. Now hopefully this equation looks somewhat familiar because what we now need to do here is simply state that the delta t is equal to zero. And then by differentiating both the m and the t, we can express in the form dm by dt is equal to qn plus r gen minus q out plus, uh, sorry, minus r cons. Now that is the balance that you should be familiar with, especially for the accumulation term. 
is the differential equation of the mass changing with respect to time. That is the part of the process for the development of batch reactor model designs. So you sh hopefully should be familiar with that. If you're not, again, don't worry about it. There is a lot, we have a lot of resources for all of this, um, both on the YouTube channel and via our website as well. So don't worry if it doesn't make 100% sense. It will in just a second. Now, if we take the equation that we just um, created, and this is known as an ordinary first order differential equation. So in order for this to be solved, we have to set a set of boundary conditions, and these need to be specified. And the usual assumption here is when time is equal to zero, i.e. we can specify the initial conditions of the system before the reaction takes place. Now, since we can write the accumulation in, term, in the form of m of t, because we know that as time changes, the value of m will change, we could therefore express dm over dt as mt and replace t with zero and then solve for the right-hand side of the equation. Now, this is why the configuration is termed as the differential balance because we have a first order differential equation and we can express it in this form, which makes it a lot more convenient for us. Now let's take a look at a case study on how you would actually go about implementing the differential balance. Now what we have here is a CSTR is used to produce a compound R from A in a liquid phase system. The feed enters at a rate of Q0, which is litres per second, so we have a volumetric flow rate, with a concentration of Ca0, which is moles of A per litre, and the reactor can be assumed to have perfect mixing with a volume V litres. Now the reaction rate is first order, as it was A to R, and can be expressed as KCA, which is moles per second litre of reaction volume. And we can assume that the density of all the fluids are the same and are constant throughout. So density is gram per litre. Now what we want to do is write the differential balance on the total mass and moles of A. Express the balance in terms of the variables discussed above. So all of these here. So we've got two types of balances we need to do. So before we actually jump in to the solve, it's always a good idea to visualise the system with a schematic. So we'll take our batch reactor here and we'll put in our entry point, so that's Q0, Ca0 and the density. We have our reactor volume V and then we have Q, Ca and rho. The only distinction here is that the knots imply the inputs and without the knots they imply the outputs. Now we'll do the overall balance first. So we say accumulation is equal to what comes in minus what comes out. We have a CSTR. We have a continuous system. So what we're now saying here is that the mass of the reactor, in order for us to work this out, must be the volume of the reactor multiplied by the density of the fluids. Because that way the litres will cancel each other out and we're left with grams. So now what we can do is we can express the accumulation in a few different ways. We can express it as dm over dt, which is fine, but we don't have m. We have the volume and the density. So we can actually replace dm with d rho v, because rho times v is equal to m. Now we are told in the question that the density is constant. So therefore we bring this out of the equation so that becomes rho dv by dt that's your our accumulation term now our input is simply going to be q um not that's the volumetric flow coming in we need to multiply that by the density in order to give us the velocity and then minus q multiplied by rho now what you can see here is that the density features in all three terms so we can actually cancel them out and what we're left with is dv by dt is equal to q0 minus q, i.e. what is the difference between what comes in and comes out? That makes sense. Because if we have more comes in than leaves, 
that will tell us how much accumulates within the system. So that makes sense. Now from here, what we can do is we can set our boundary conditions that can then for be applied. So since we can specify the initial time and the final time, the initial and final volume can be determined by when t equals zero, v must equal v naught. That makes sense because the volume hasn't actually changed. But if our volume is fixed, then V0 would actually become V, which would then eliminate a degree of freedom. But if we have varying amount of volume within the system, this last part would not apply. So therefore, if we have varying um, levels within the reactor, we would have V and V0. Now, what that would mean if the volume um, of the system was constant, we could, after the differential, we could solve and get what T and V are in a linear relationship. Now, that's the first part. Now, what we need to do here is apply the same methodology, but this time with component A as the reference, not the overall system, component A because now what we need to do is include the consumption term within the general balance. But another thing that we have to be careful of, and this is something that used to trip me up all the time as a student, is when you have a reacting system, you cannot work in mass. You must work in moles. So therefore, what we need to do is re-express our accumulation term, because previously it was in terms of mass, here it's now in terms of moles. So what we then do is we say, well, the moles of A in the reactor would be the volume multiplied by the concentration of A. So the liters would cancel here and we have moles. So that's the key distinction. So now dn by dt can be a function of dv and dca0 by dt because the concentration will change with respect to time, and the volume will change with respect to time. Hence, transient processes. So now, our Q0 and our Q will remain the same, they are our volumetric flows, but we will now have our CA0, which is the inlet concentration, and CA, which is the final concentration, and then our consumption will be the reaction rate, which is KCA, multiplied by the volume, so V. Now, if we apply the boundary conditions where time is zero, then the concentration of A will be the initial concentration, CA0. So therefore, when T is zero, CA will equal CA of zero, which is equivalent to the initial concentration of CA0. So that, therefore, will eliminate another degree of freedom. So you, what you could now do is proceed to solve the equation for the output concentration given as CA of T, i.e. what is the final concentration for any given time parameter. And that is basically the differential balance for a transient process. So that's the end of this lesson. Thanks for watching. Hopefully this was helpful in understanding what a transient process is and how you apply the differential balance method in order to solve such systems. If you like this video, please like subscribe to the channel. It really helps us reach as many chemical engineering students as possible. Thank you for your time and we hope to see you in another video.